Hello, and welcome to today's TED Talk, Breaking and Bad, where we'll discuss the pros and cons of network behavior anomaly detection. My name is Rob Richardson, and I teach here at St. Clair County Community College. What is NBED? Well, it's a type of network monitoring that uses traffic metadata, typically net flow data, to, to uh, determine anomalies. In order to use NEMBAD, you have, first have to baseline your network traffic. Figure out what normal is and then whitelist that normal traffic. NBAD will then compare what the, the current traffic that it's observing to that predefined normal baseline. And from that, it will determine what's anomalous, what's weird, what's unusual, what's strange. Now, there are different levels of weird and strange so that we have to develop weighting factors that we can apply mathematically to determine how weird is weird, how anomalous is anomalous. And because of that, NBAD tends to be pretty metric-centric, does a lot of math, a lot of computations, and it tends to be resource-intensive. So you will have to have some pretty beefy hardware in order to run this. NBAD was the, began to its development around the year 2000 with several, several different groups throughout the country. Um, at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, a pro, they worked on a project called Terminator. And at Georgia Tech, a project called Stealth Watch was initiated. Stealth Watch, by the way, has, sin, has since become a commercial product sold by a company called Landcope. At Carnegie Mellon and CERT, they developed an open source project called Silk which was later on modified to use Python and so became PySilk. The base protocol that most of these NBAD systems use is called NetFlow. And NetFlow was originally developed by Cisco to develop to produce statistics about their about network traffic on Cisco networks. There are however a number of companies that have created NetFlow clones, NetFlow imitators. The current official Cisco version is version 9, but many people still use version 5. A NetFlow packet looks like this. It has a header, and in the header would be the version of NetFlow that's being used, a sequence number, a, an export timestamp, the timestamp of when the data was exported to the monitoring station, and the number of records contained in the data. Each net NetFlow data segment would include an, index, uh, an input index, which typically is a network interface, and an output in, uh, index, again, another net, network interface. Uh, there's a timestamp and the number of bytes in that flow. Then there's a source, and source IP address and source port, along with a destination IP address and destination port, the type of service, uh, the combination of all TCP flags in use in that communication, uh, and then the IP address of the next top and the net mass of the communicating IP addresses are sort of optional. They're not always included. There are a number of NetFlow clones. Obviously, the Cisco is the official source of NetFlow, and they've defined version 9 in RFC 3950. IP fix is an open source version of NetFlow. Sometimes you'll see that listed as version 10. Uh, and that's defined in RFC 5101. JFlow is, was developed by Juniper Networks. But if you look at the packet format and squint real hard, you'll realize that JFlow is really just NetFlow version 5. Uh, NetStream was developed by 3ComHP and Huawei. CFlowD is used by Alcatraz. Alcatel and Lucent, Rflow by Ericsson, and Appflow by Citrix. And there are a number of others um, used by, uh, developed by other companies. Uh, there are a number of commercial NBAD products. In fact, the list is so long that I had to select which ones to talk about. And so I basically decided to use only the products that I've seen um, vendors at trade shows. Uh, so, for instance, IBM's product is called QRadar. McAfee and Symantec both have products in the NBAD category. Juniper has STRM. Solana uses SmartFlow. HP uses uh, Network Immunity Manager, and so forth. Uh, there are some open source NBAD projects. Uh, Silk and BuySilk, again, from Carnegie Mellon. 
Armon is probably the best open source uh, NBAD product out there, although it seems to be fairly difficult to configure. Bro is not really designed to do NBAD, but if you properly script it, it can do some rudimentary NBAD analysis. There are several different types of network detection. Um, probably the most common is signature based. That would be something like an antivirus or a traditional IDS. Uh, it's easy to implement, but the disadvantage is that they can only detect known threats. A signature must already have been written uh, in order for a signature based uh, detection to occur. Behavioral detections um, are looking for patterns of behavior. We know if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So we know what a port scan looks like, even if we don't know for sure what piece of malware or what tool is being used to create to conduct the port scan. Um, the disadvantage, of course, to behavioral scans is often to do this. You're going to need to establish counters on the individual hosts to look for things and count things. One or two pings is not unnormal. 100,000 pings in an hour is very abnormal. You'll need to establish counters to be able to detect that. Anomaly-based detectors are good at de um, detecting malicious traffic that's actually authorized. So when people steal credentials and use their network and access systems that those credentials allow, other types of detectors aren't going to flag that because that traffic is authorized. But when they do things that are atypical, then that will trigger an anomaly detector. It's not normal. Um, the disadvantage, of course, for anomaly detection is that it requires very extensive setup and a lot of configuration. It takes a long time to get your whitelist and your baselines correct. And then once it's running, it is very resource intensive. So this is a chart I've actually taken from a talk given by Charles Herring uh, with, of Landcope. Um, but I thought it pretty, it summed up very well the kind of the uses of the various types of detection. Signatures work very well, very rapidly for known exploits. So if you're looking for something from last year, a signature-based detector would be your best choice. But they don't do very well with zero-day attacks. There's no definition uh, written for that yet. And things like credential abuse, again, the user is authorized. That's not, that's, that's not going to be found. Uh, behavioral detector, detectors are good at known exploits. They know to look for those things. But they're really good at zero-day attacks because there's only so many different things these attacks will do. And so if we know what the end result behavior looks like, then we can tell that even if we don't know the, the malware that's producing it. Uh, but they don't, behavioral detectors don't do very well with credential abuse. Anomaly detectors, they'll work with known exploits, but that's not really their use. They take up too much processing power to really be used for that. Zero-day attacks, they will find those. They will say that's not normal. But the thing that they're best at is looking at abused credentials, right? Obtaining credentials is one of the goals for a malicious attacker nowadays, and anomaly detectors are very good at that. Now, obviously, your company is not going to choose to just deploy one or the other of these. The best solution is going to incorporate all three of these approaches to detection. So when does NBAD work well? Well, if your network has predictable traffic patterns, then it's easy to baseline, it's easy to whitelist, it's easy to tell what's strange. And environments that don't change rapidly, because you have to constantly update that whitelist and baseline as you make changes to your environment, it's going to be more effective if you don't make those, very, those kinds of changes very often. It also works really well when users have well-defined roles and activities so that things that they do on your network are predictable. When does NBAD not work very well? Well, in a highly dynamic or flexible environment, in an environment where we use BYOD, because that'll change with every, you know, the types of traffic we see will change with every device that's brought into the network. Um, uncontrolled environments, like perhaps a college dorm or a college campus classroom, 
right? Things where there's unpredictable traffic patterns and then users in a small business, for instance, that would have to wear many hats and do many different job functions throughout the work week. One of the interesting things that you can use Embed to do is to check compliance because compliance would equal predictable patterns. You should be able to predict the types of traffic patterns you would see. So if we whitelist the compliant traffic, when we see anomalous traffic, that's probably non-compliant. So let's do some NBAD case studies. Okay. So NBAD detecting misused credentials. In our scenario here, Skyler, an accountant, begins moving data in ways that would normally be authorized. In this case, however, the specifics of that transfer are not normal. The data volume is several times what would normally be seen in the course of a day. And then she begins, or her user begins, sending a very large number of emails, much larger than normal, each of which would have an attached binary file. The kicker in this is that then the destination of those emails is a server located in Ukraine, and Skylar's company does not do business with Ukraine. NBAD, detecting stolen credentials. Hank, a DEA agent based in Albuquerque, Albuquerque, logs off of his system at the office at 5 o'clock. That's typically when he would leave for the day. NBAD knows that. He logs in again at 6. That's not unheard of. But this time, he logs in from Columbia. I, I think we've retired all the supersonic commercial transport jets, so I don't think there's a way for him to get to Albuquerque to Columbia in an hour. So obviously that's abnormal. That's going to be somebody who's managed to obtain uh, the DEA agent's credentials. Walter, an educator, logs in at his school's network at 3 a.m. Very unusual for a high school teacher. And begins making large number of very rapid queries for data from, his, from a uh, SQL database through the intranet web page. That obviously looks like a SQL injection attack. Data exfiltration. The web server at Los Poyos Hermanos suddenly sends 100 meg of traffic to a destination in China. Being a local fast food chain, Dos Hermanos does not normally do business in China. At the law firm of Saul Goodman, the receptionist PC suddenly begins to both simultaneously send and receive encrypted network traffic. Under normal circumstances, that receptionist never sends, neither sends nor receives encrypted traffic. That's probably, she's probably infected with a bot and, and her system is acting as a botnet proxy. So I have a live demo prepared for today. Um, it's not quite what uh, I would have hoped. Um, ultimately, the scripting in Bro um, to create it, to allow it to do NBAD detection escaped me, but I am using uh, Bro on Security Onion here. We'll look under the category for weird traffic. I've picked the top weird types. These are unusual traffic by any definition, not just in our environment here at the college. Things that should not occur, like a truncated IP address, or inappropriate fins, uh, the fin flag in the TCP header, right? Uh, bad TCP checksums, uh, many of those. One of the interesting things, if you drill down in and look at the actual data that's being captured here by Bro, the top two categories are entirely from the system I've installed Bro on. So Bro itself is responsible for the top two categories of data. So, I hope you enjoyed the little uh, fun take on popular culture I used with this presentation. I find that when I teach classes, doing things like that, dropping references to movies, TV shows, or other things that they would be interested in, helps to engage students. Um, I used a website, um, sbll.org, to create the Breaking Bad title screens, and the other graphics are all obtained under a Creative, creative Commons license. Uh, I used a number of sources in the preparation of this paper. Um, 
The thing that prompted me to do this to begin with was two years ago at GERCON in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I sat through a presentation by Charles Herring of Landcope, uh, which I found to be very interesting. Um, thank you for your time.